Great. Welcome everyone to the first of a series of policy dialogue and webinars hosted by the USP 2030 Working Group on Social Protection and Food Systems Transformation on the very pressing subject of the current global food and nutrition crisis. The event follows the publication of a blog post on the same topic on socialprotection.org, as well as a soon to be released podcast episode discussing the unaffordability of nutritious and healthy diets and how do we see social protection interventions contributing to address this problem. This discussion also takes place as part of the many interesting discussions taking place in commemoration of the World Food Day this month, where we come to reflect on the challenges and opportunities to address food insecurity and malnutrition around the globe. This is a key event in the context of the USP 2030 Working Group Policy Dialogue Series, which is an ongoing series of learning and reflection initiatives aimed at zooming in on the most pressing issues surrounding social protection and food systems. The policy dialogue series uh, brings all working group members together, as well as practitioners, academics, and relevant stakeholders with the goal of capitalizing on our collective knowledge and experience and turn it into real solutions to the problems identified by governments, development, and humanitarian partners with whom we work. This is the raison d'etre uh, of our alliance and the shared vision that unites our organizations and many of the ones uh, represented here today. Speaking on the critical challenges by the global food and nutritious crisis, we have some of the most authoritative voices in the field. And I would like uh, to have the next slide to start introducing our very nice um, speakers. Can we go to the next? Thank you. Great. Um, so here we have the list of speakers. We're very glad to have you and maybe we can go to the next slide so I can properly introduce them to you. So first uh, we have uh, Professor William Masters, uh, who's a professor at the Department of Economics at Tufts University, and he will delineate the causes and consequences of the global food and nutrition crisis, uh, specifically focusing on the affordability of healthy diets. In the second section, um, we will have Hugo Gentilini, who's the global lead for social assistance at the World Bank, and he will describe how social protection has been used to respond to the momentous rise in inflation rates around the globe. And the third and final section will address the larger role of social protection navigating the current crisis and building forward better to improve resilience for future ones. Speaking on these, we're very lucky uh, to have Natalia Winder Rossi, who's the Director of Social Policy and Social Protection at UNICEF. Uh, we also have in the, we can maybe move to the next slide, thank you. Uh, we will have uh, Sol Morris, uh, who is the Director of Program Services at GAIN, and Marco Knowles, who's the Senior Social Protection Officer at FAO. My name is Juan Gonzalo Jaramillo Mejia. I will be moderating this session, and I am a Program Policy Advisor for Social Protection at the World Food Program. So thank you very much uh, for all of us here. Please, uh, we, we want to thank, first of all, to all the speakers for their time and for their contributions to this policy dialogue series. We're extremely fortunate to be able to benefit and learn from your collective knowledge. And thank you for everyone who has been involved in the organization of this event, in particular, Anthony Wendt from GAIN, and uh, Annalise Borrell, Tom Okubo from UNICEF, and, and many other partners, and particularly from socialprotection.org, as well as all our working group members. Um, we want to, 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 remam to remind you all that we have a chat box for questions and answers, that you can tweet using the hashtag sp.org webinar, and uh, we will be monitoring uh, that chat box throughout the webinar. Um, so following the, now, we're going to go into the first section, and we have um, uh, William Masters, who is going to paint a very clear and comprehensive picture of the global food and nutrition crisis. So uh, without further ado, I, I'm, I'm pleased to leave the stage to him. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Juan Gonzalo, and to everybody for joining. Uh, first of all, it's a real privilege for me to be part of this conversation. Um, as you can see, 
as Juan Gonzalez said, I'm an, I'm an academic, I'm a professor um, in the School of Nutrition. I'm also an economist in our Department of Economics, as he mentioned. Um, and you know, so I'm not a practitioner, right? So I learn from you how the world actually works and try to teach it in the classroom and do this kind of research. And the research I do is actually about food prices and this cost of healthy diets. So food matching food to nutrition uh, in this project we call Food Prices for Nutrition, uh, using understanding food prices and trying to improve um, affordability of healthy diets. And it seemed that this has big implications for the conversation. So I'm really here to just share what we've learned about food prices uh, and explore the possibility that this could be helpful to you so that we can share from the amazing experience of the panelists and then all of you uh, in the chat box and the Q&A session today and then this dialogue series um, in the coming months. So my belief, my hope, <laughs> is that our new data on the cost and affordability of all of these items on the top right, I'll keep having photographs of these foods just to remind us of what we're talking about, it's the prices of um, not just starchy staples and basic grains and oils that would be part of a minimalist ration, but the full set of foods needed for a person to reach their human potential. Um, and so that's fruits and vegetables, and then small amounts of animal source foods needed for a child to grow and for an adult to thrive. So the question is, can our new data about this help you, help you in your work uh, on social protection, where the big new thing is that our background research, our, our background papers for uh, the FAO, commissioned by the FAO, have been used in the UN system agency's um, SOFI report, the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World, to begin to use the term affordability, to speak of affordability as this new operational metric of global food security, so that we have the longtime goal of tracking physical and economic access made operational, an actual way of measuring physical and economic access to healthy diets. The World Bank, as of July this year, now reports this for all countries. So you see in this screenshot, if your screen is big enough, this goes from Germany to Haiti uh, to an average for all high-income countries. And what we've done in this is to basically generalize work that had been uh, led in great measure by the WFP uh, through the fill the nutrient gap and cost of the diet work uh, led by Saskia DePay and many others um, to target uh, basic rations uh, and expand those basic rations into these other food groups. Uh, that was a, a key thing that we have now generalized in the work I'm going to share now. So this provides an, an actionable goal for the world food system, uh, as we saw at the end of the food system summit. Um, where this number, 3 billion people who could not afford this healthy diet made possible by the methods I'll talk about now, uh, becomes the framing of what a new food system could be like, one in which uh, these all these healthy foods are in fact affordable to people. So what is, just want to do a little bit of a dive into what this is that, that uh, allows us to uh, guide, I hope to guide uh, and, 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 and mobilize resources for social protection to be targeted and adequate to the task, you probably know that for decades, um, since the discovery of what calories were, cal caloric adequacy, just, just enough energy to go from day to day has been central. And then there's this collection of other goals about food that have been on the forefront of people's minds for, for a very long time. And what we've done is to take the least cost items in each food group as a new kind of food price index uh, just to think about, is healthy food affordable? So when we do that, we remember that both nutrients like vitamin A or vitamin C or iron or zinc, those are necessary, but they're not sufficient. This additional step up towards overall healthy diets is in terms of food groups to get all of the uh, phytochemicals and the antioxidants and the probiotics and the different lipids like omega-3 fatty acids and things that are in these foods that you need to have the whole food group for. So our goal is to take the least cost items that would meet health needs to and, and add up their cost so as to distinguish unaffordability when people just cannot buy this from other barriers to healthy eating. So the goal and social protection would be to make sure that social protection makes it possible for people to acquire these. Um, so, so what is the research behind this? First of all, it's very recent. It's in the American Journal of Agricultural Economics in 2018 that our first paper 
on the cost of diet diversity, finding the least cost items across every food group came out in 2018, a whole series of research papers on comparing that to the cost of basic nutrients um, and how food groups differ from nutrients. Um, and then for the UN system agencies, SOFI 2020, getting this cost of recommended diets. And then with SOFI 2022, this new concept of a healthy diet basket. And I'll talk about that in just a minute, but it's really important to remember that actual food choice among the items that people can afford to buy, observed demand is very different from this because we're now trying to measure access and give people the option, the opportunity to make something affordable to them. In practice, what people buy might be very different. So there's a whole agenda around, around that. But here we're just asking, do people have access at all? So what do we mean when we say access? This table just gives you the actual items that we are looking at in markets around the world. Just give you three examples, Senegal, Pakistan, Italy. You can see how to have an overall healthy diet, you need a balance across different food groups, starchy staples, vegetables, fruits, animal source foods in small quantities, pulses, nuts, and seeds, and oils and fats. You need a proportional balance between them that can be met with the local food system in different ways. So just looking across the starchy staples category, you notice that maize is very important in both uh, Africa and Asia, that wheat is particularly important in very dry land places, rice elsewhere, uh, and that in some cases it's a processed product like pasta in Italy. Among vegetables, certain vegetables are very low cost in many places, others might be low cost only in certain places. Similarly for fruits, sometimes it could be a dried fruit, uh, sometimes um, internationally traded bananas, sometimes something like coconut that might not be traded. Animal source foods could be dried fish, milk, uh, or even uh, a meat product, and so forth. So our key discoveries begin with the idea that the cost of the least expensive items in these food groups is actually pretty similar at different levels of national income. So poor and rich countries are uh, both having to pay roughly similar costs. There's no discount for poor countries. So along the x-axis of this picture, you have uh, the average real income, the total amount of goods and services that people can buy in the very poorest countries of the world, you know, at like uh, two or three or four dollars a day per capita income, and then the richest countries of the world at like a hundred thousand dollars a year. So what you see is on the y-axis, the cost per day of the least expensive items in all the food groups, and poor countries have to pay roughly the same cost as for these items in, in uh, high-income countries. The most important thing to know right now for social protection about the food crisis we're in now is that the real cost of food is up a lot. So the most recent data we have is just 2020. The overall cost of food is up by um, maybe three, four, five percent to 2020. And then in 2021 and 22, another three, four, five, six percent uh, for each level of real income. So uh, people are poorer in 2022 now than they were in 2020 because prices are up, but incomes um, are up less, less than that. So that's the crisis that Hugo and the rest of the panelists will discuss in a moment. Um, but I want to make sure we're aware that it's not just food, that meals are about food and energy. Uh, energy to cook and time to cook uh, is very, very important. So I hope that in this conversation we can talk about the food energy crisis uh, as well as just food uh, prices and social protection to cover the cost of meal preparation as well as the cost of buying uh, food items. So what's the point? The point is that you know these new data might be helpful to you as you do your work. I believe it appears that social protection efforts can be guided by this information about the least expensive food items at each country, in each market location, each region of a country, uh, and every month from, from month to month. So first of all, to debate resource mobilization, should there be appropriations? Should there be grants uh, made? This is affordability of a universal basic human need. It is not something specific to a country or any particular group of people. It's a universal same diet for all people. And it gives us a number that you can compute that's useful, I think, uh, within countries by region, by month, by type of household for targeting purposes. And then in terms of the gap between affordability and actual incomes uh, to make sure that adequacy is achieved. 
So even in very rich countries like the United States, where we have a great difficulty passing through our legislature any kind of social protection uh, mandates, we do have a system of uh, debit cards, cash-like payments uh, that are given to low-income people. It's called the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, and it's been appropriated since 1961 so that we have a political coalition around providing people assistance for food and the amount of that debit card that the United States provides, we do very little social assistance to low-income people, but we do do that. The amount of it is determined by diet costs. And that's how we get uh, through our legislature appropriations every, every year. So for many people um, in every part of the world, there are some adding up to 3 billion in the world who cannot afford these least cost healthy items. Why? Because these items are expensive. They're hard to produce and to distribute around the world. Seasonality makes a huge difference uh, and social protection is important to build resilience to all kinds of shocks in the food system and especially in people's own livelihoods, any incident of illness or unemployment um, or other reason for uh, a shock. Now, while we think about this, it's important to remember that for most people in the world uh, and probably most people on this call, we can afford a healthy diet, but we may not eat one every day. Um, and that's because food choice among affordable items is driven by many factors other than the least cost healthy items. So that's cost of cooking, time, space for meal preparation, all of that, and social protection can have a big impact on that as well uh, in terms of people's housing, in terms of people access to energy for meal preparation, their transportation options uh, and, and their time use. So I hope this information is, is helpful and useful um, and really look forward to the, the conversation now. Thank you, William. Thank you, William, for painting such a clear and comprehensive picture of the global food and nutrition crisis for all of us. And, and to really spelling out that opportunity uh, that understanding the affordability of healthy diets pose to social protection policy and programming. Thank you so much. So this leads us uh, directly to discussing the role that social protection has played, is currently playing and can continue to play in the short, medium and long term to both mitigate the current inflationary spiral, as well as build resilience to respond to future financial, nutritional and health crisis. To this end, I leave the floor to one of the uh, one of the foremost experts on the subject, uh, Ugo Gentilini. Thank you, Ugo, for joining us. And over to you. Uh, thank you, Gonzalo, uh, for bringing us together. Um, uh, great to join you and colleagues for this important conversation. By the way, great presentation. Well, I really uh, learned a lot, very relevant for the social protection community. Um, what I'd like to do here very briefly is to lay out some uh, facts and figures on uh, the current responses to inflation, which themselves uh, build on a series of responses to other recent uh, and ongoing crises. And uh, um, let me see, slides are not moving. Are they moving? Let's see, okay. Uh, there you go. Okay, so uh, just until uh, earlier this year, we were clearly witnessing probably the largest uh, scale up of social protection in history, the response to, to COVID. This is um, data up to February of 2022. Uh, we know that the countries responded with about 2% of GDP on average, over $3 trillion uh, uh, spent globally. At least four countries uh, reached uh, more than 100 million people. 13 economies went uh, fully universal um uh, coverage is about 16 to 17 percent of the world population that's uh, 1.3 billion uh, people so uh quite remarkable in terms of magnitude um and uh, what would have happened in the absence of those responses uh, uh, the jury is in um as we speak and uh um work by uh, my world bank colleagues also has shown what would have happened in that absence in the absence of fiscal responses, particularly social protection. And, uh, and visually, you just uh, contrast the orange and green dots, oranges, where were poverty, how much poverty would have been out there uh, by country in the absence of responses, the green dots uh, take into account uh, 
the mitigating effect of social protection, you could see that uh, uh, the difference is uh, very large for a number of uh, uh, high income and middle income countries, and it tends to, to shrink as, uh, as uh, uh, country incomes uh, decline. So effects were a little larger in, uh, in higher income countries. And, uh, and then comes, uh, comes February, war in, uh, in Ukraine, and um, a range of new responses are out uh, to support the uh, displaced uh, Ukrainian populations. Uh, we estimate that that occurred in about 41 countries, over 700 measures put in place. Um, interesting to note how uh, a number of traditional social protection responses were bundled together with other services uh, related to housing, to, to education, transportation, and, and more, particularly a number of European countries under the Temporary Protection Directive. Um, so we have seen a lot of action on that front, um, and, and it's currently ongoing. And then comes, uh, comes inflation. Um, it started uh, be before, arguably, the, the war. So uh, the war has amplified what seemed to be an, uh, an, an ongoing process. Um, we have a new tracker that uh, captures uh, over 600 measures uh, put in place as specific responses uh, uh, to inflation. We're going to have a new update uh, coming out uh, uh, late November, mid-November, at the moment, we have three updates, and, and this is some of the most uh, recent data. Uh, if we contrast what happened in COVID with what's happening now, you'll see that the composition of responses is kind of compressed, whereas um, social assistance um, includes about 40% of responses in COVID. Now it's about a quarter of total responses with uh, a larger number of subsidies trade-related and, and tax-related measures relative to social assistance, insurance, and, and labor markets. So that we see a little bit of a shift here. Um, interesting to note, uh, among those, um, um, those measures, uh, uh, subsidies themselves um, occupy and you know, uh, claim a, a wide share of responses. That's about 36% in total. This includes subsidies for energy, for food, for agriculture fertilizers and a range of uh, fee subsidies for uh, various utilities, electricity, water, that actually uh, utility subsidies is the largest, uh, uh, fee subsidies is the largest uh, component of, of those subsidy responses. Uh, overall, um, for programs uh, for which data is available, we have about, we estimate uh, uh, a little over 300 billion uh, 328 billion in terms of responses. Um, a, a big share of that uh, comes from uh, uh, countries in Europe and, and Central Asia, but you can see that uh, every region has, uh, has the responses uh, in place, but uh, about 140 billion out of the 330 is from the ECA region. Uh, five countries have spent more than 3% of GDP in responses. One country, Iran, over 4%. Um, overall, we see that uh, uh, between uh, uh, four, between 1.8% uh, of GDP on average uh, for the MENA region, then down to uh, about 0.1% in, in North America for a global average of 0.8% of uh, GDP. Remember, remember COVID response was about 2% of GDP, but that is over two years. Here it's uh, more or less six months. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a trajectory that seems uh, broadly consistent with what we have seen uh, in COVID. We estimate that if you took, take the entire package of responses, um, they will cover over 900 million people um, that's nearly one third of the population in countries for which we have data uh, on average. So again, pretty remarkable. Out of those 900, 622 million people are reached by cash transfers. Uh, this is, uh, uh, again, um, uh, quite remarkable. Uh, hasn't reached yet the level of COVID. But again, let's remind ourselves that uh, this data only refers to six months, so 622 million people is, uh, it's a big number. 
Um, we have uh, estimated also the adequacy of, uh, of responses, something that Will also brought up, uh, the importance of estimating adequacy. Um, this is about 20% of uh, uh, average daily median income. Um, you can see by it's slightly more generous, actually it's significantly more generous for social assistance relative to subsidies and in monetary terms that translates from about $1 a day in uh, low-income countries to $7 in high-income countries uh, on average. Um, and finally, this uh, response is uh, um, or in general um, short term, but uh, they have been fairly continuous at the moment. So uh, that's about five months uh, on average. We'll see um, as uh, as we go with the trackers over the next uh, few months, whether some of these measures uh, would expire, whether they would uh, uh, be renewed. Uh, but on average, they last at the moment uh, about 5.2 uh, months. So some takeaways, this is my last slide before handing the mic to, to Natalia. Um, the jury's out on uh, still on response effectiveness for inflation. The jury's in for the COVID ones, uh, but we'll see for for inflation their effectiveness. Uh, but it's clear that uh, there is a vibrant uh, set of measures that are put in place across an array of different components. Interesting fact: so much of the COVID response was. Um, uh, or relied on new interventions. That's uh, an, over 90% of COVID responses in relation to cash transfers were new programs. And now we see in terms of inflation responses, another wave of new programs, over half of cash transfer responses are, are new. So we, we, we seem to keep introducing uh, new programs uh, uh, to crisis or back to back. Um, there is a, a, a little bit of reversal in the use of social assistance. Uh, I showed the graph of the compressed uh, composition with uh, uh, subsidies in particular um, uh, playing a, uh, a renewed major role. Uh, but still, the scale is remarkable. Over 600 million people uh, covered by, by cash as we speak. Mid-November, we'll have more information on, on what's uh, uh, what's the latest based on September and October data? Over to you, Juan Gonzalo. Thank you, Hugo. In, in, some impressive key takeaways there. Thank you so much and for your profoundly insightful analysis. Uh, now that we have understood on a macro level the magnitude of the financial, nutritional, energy, and human capital cost of the crisis, as well as of the social protection responses that have been put into place, it is time to learn from the experience uh, from our partners on the ground. And I would like to um, give the floor to Sol, Natalia, and Marco, but Sol will come first uh, to tell us about the lessons learned from the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition in responding to the crisis through social protection. Um, so over to you, Saul, then we will have Natalia. Thank you very much, Juan Gonzalo. Let me share my screen. Yes, take your time. Thank you so much for joining us. We see the screen. There you go. Great, perfect, so thank, you. thank you. I'm going to talk today about uh, social respo uh, protection responses and the lessons that we learned uh, at the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, trying to respond particularly to the COVID crisis. So for those of you who don't know the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, we're a Swiss-based organization, essentially an international NGO, and we focus on nutrition outcomes, and particularly by trying to improve the consumption of nutritious and safe food for all people, especially those most vulnerable to malnutrition. So I will unapologetically be focusing in on the nutrition dimensions uh, of social protection responses to the food crisis. Um, not to say that the other dimensions are not important, but just that's the angle that we come from. So building on uh, what Will said earlier, 
Uh, this is an illustrative example of a population of a, uh, an indicative East African country divided into 10 groups from the poorest number one to the richest uh, number 10. And you can see that uh, the amount of income that they have available to spend every day per person varies from less than a dollar, international dollar, up uh, right to uh, $9 in the richest group. And that is not uh, atypical for. Uh, many countries in, in Africa. And I put two lines on here. One, if you look at the uh, blue line, that is the cost of the cheapest nutrient adequate diet, but it's inflated to 150% to allow for households to buy other things in addition to food. So you can see that in this country, uh, that cost is in excess of what's available to people to use to make purchases for certainly for the bottom 70% 7, of the population, and really just on the cusp of being possible uh, for the eighth uh, decile of the population. So the point I want to make here is that a relatively small uh, increase in the cost of food would bump up, uh, would, would increase the proportion of the population who cannot afford a nutritious diet uh, very quickly. So if we just increase that blue line by perhaps 20%, uh, not atypical for what we're seeing at the moment for inflation effects, you will see that for the eighth decile, it becomes uh, uh, absolutely impossible to access a nutritious diet. And very quickly, that reaches the ninth decile as well. And these impacts of price changes are not distributed across all foods equally. So this is the uh, own price elasticity of major food groups. How much uh, consumption of these food groups will go down as their prices go up. And you can see that you get a much more, a much larger decrease in consumption re uh, in response to price change for the most nutritious food groups. So that could be fish or meat or dairy or fruit and vegetable compared to the staples such as uh, cereals. So not only does inflation uh, uh, eliminate or, or reduce people's uh, capacity, their, their effective income that they can deploy to buy food, but it affects particularly the most nutritious, uh, nutrient dense foods are likely to be uh, eliminated or reduced in the diet. And this uh, 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 graph here refers to low income countries, I should say. So in mid uh, 2020, GAIN launched our COVID-19 emergency response program. Uh, we went out of our way to talk to donors to try and get additional funds to be able uh, to uh, work on uh, uh, responding to the COVID-19 crisis. And there were two areas of our work here that were particularly relevant to this discussion. Uh, firstly, we actually provided direct food assistance. So we supported food systems workers uh, directly helping them to access uh, nutritious foods. And secondly, we also worked to improve the, what I would call an aspect of the adequacy of social protection, but I'm thinking not, not of its uh, adequacy in terms of amount of money, but rather the amount of nutrients that it was able to provide. And we did this by trying to ensure that staple foods were, wherever possible, fortified with additional nutrients and vitamins, something that we work on in all, uh, ever since the organization has been created, in fact. But we doubled down on that because we realized that as prices went up or, or nutritious foods became uh, inaccessible for many reasons, it was important that staples, to the degree possible, would also provide some of those key nutrients, minerals, and vitamins. So I'll talk first of all a little bit about uh, the work that we did in providing direct uh, food assistance and uh, working with uh, food systems workers and food distribution networks. So our work uh, trying to get food to workers who had been laid off uh, suddenly from companies who were not able to operate. And so they, they were, had struggled greatly to uh, continue to pay their, their workforce. Uh, and what our logic was, we didn't want uh, that workforce to disappear and to be lost to the companies because these companies provide essential food systems uh, services. And so as soon as the crisis became 
uh, somewhat lessened. We wanted them to have access again to all of their existing staff. So we thought it was in everybody's interest to keep these staff well and, and fed. And so we provided 115 uh, critical food systems companies with emergency grants and benefited more than 50,000 workers. And we negotiated baskets of food, which included things like fortified staples, fortified oil, fruits, vegetables, nuts, pulses, eggs, things that we thought were nutritious. And one of the lessons that we learned was that we had to have a lot of back and forth with these companies to agree on the composition of food baskets. It took a lot of explaining to uh, convince many companies that, for example, vegetables or pulp or eggs were things that were important to include, and it shouldn't be only just sugar or, for, or oil, for example. Um, we used all of Meals at Work, take-home rations and vouchers, and this sparked a lot of interest in, particularly in the guidelines for how companies could go about supporting their workers. And um, we're taking that forward now in a more systemic approach by uh, a work, uh, setting up the Workforce Nutrition Alliance, which encourages companies to provide nutritious food for their workers and for their supply chain workers. And this is how we try and link uh, food security, healthy diets and nutrition with another as important aspect of social protection, which is decent work. We also worked through private food distribution networks. One of the ways that we, one of the characteristics of my organization is that we work uh, uh, often with private uh, organizations as well as uh, bridging that to the government. And in Pakistan, we found some very uh, important large scale private dist food distribution networks. And by using these, we were able to provide 8.6 million people with, or rather 8.6 million fortified meals uh, served through these channels. And here an important lesson learned was how difficult it was to achieve gender equity using these channels. As you can see from this photo, it's far easier using these channels to reach men than it was to reach women. And this was a real concern to us because we'd committed to gender equity in our response. We also, as I mentioned, worked towards uh, contributing towards more nutritionally adequate social protection. Here are a couple of examples to that. In Egypt, we, along with many other agencies, attempted to uh, reinstate a previous national fortification program working with this wonderful baladi bread, so-called baladi bread in Egypt. And that has been a really difficult conversation, I must say, with the government of Egypt, uh, particularly now as they're uh, particularly severely affected by uh, rises in the cost of uh, wheat grain, which they import largely from Ukraine and Russia. In Tanzania, we've been working on incorporating uh, nutrient-dense crops in school feeding. And by that, I mean uh, special varieties of crops using traditional breeding methods, but that have been bred to contain more of, in the case of maize, more vitamin A, and in the case of beans, more iron. And uh, we've been working on this for a while and uh, both uh, uh, working on national standards and guidance, but also in working with individual schools. And as of September of this year, we achieved 65 schools consuming these uh, nutrient dense crops and reached more than 50,000 uh, students. Uh, a route to greater scale, of course, is to work with much bigger distributors of uh, key uh, items. And so in Himachal Pradesh in India, we've been supporting the government as it attempts to incorporate fortified wheat flour in uh, their uh, dis, uh, national ration system, the PDS system. And this involves capacity building, policy advocacy, and quality assurance. What's next for us in this agenda? Well, we'll carry on supporting governments to assess and take action on opportunities to improve the nutrition sensitivity of social protection. We'll work to facilitate integration of nutritious food value chains with social protection systems. We'll help ensure that food sourcing strategies and delivery mechanisms are consistent with beneficiary constraints and needs. And finally, we'll work to enhance effective utilization of nutrition supporting uh, social protection benefits through behavior change communication. Thank you. Thank you, Saul. Thank you very, very much.
Um, I would like to give the floor now to Natalia Winder Rossi, um, who will elaborate on the, on the child poverty crisis and advise us on how UNICEF has utilized an integrated systems approach in the context of the global food and nutrition crisis we're facing. Thank you, Natalia. The floor is yours. Good morning and good afternoon, colleagues. I hope we have not, there's too many presentations, apologies for, for that, but hopefully you're enjoying the, the very rich discussion and, and, and information shared. Very excited to have the opportunity to be part of this critical discussion and share a little bit of UNICEF contribution to this agenda. Um, building, of course, on what has already been shared by my fellow panelists, I just want to call your attention specifically on the impacts on children and of course the critical role that a comprehensive approach around social protection and nutrition can have in addressing these. Um, next slide, please. Um, just maybe before um, zooming into this our current crisis, I think it's important to step back and remind ourselves that the current food and, and, and uh, cost of living crisis comes on top of an already alarming situation, right? Which we know that you know we have COVID, we have climate, we have um, conflict that has already you know uh, played a very important role in 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 um, Gilding an, an unprecedented increase in poverty, including an additional 100 million children living in poverty uh, last year. An increase that we know is, is problematic across different regions. So it's not just a priority for low income countries, but also very much at the top of the agenda in, in middle and high income countries. An increase that is problematic in terms of numbers, but also in terms of the new profiles of children, families, and women that are falling into poverty, which of course calls for all of us to, to rethink our approach to addressing a poverty reduction and inequality. And, and, a, and a crisis that it's poverty, it's hunger, it's food security, as well as care, um, in terms of you know, the impacts that, the, that women and caregivers are, are, are facing in, in the current context. Next slide, please. Um, we've just published, um, with the support of the regional office in, in Europe and Central Asia and our, our research center in Innocente, a, um, a specific analysis on what was the impact of the Ukraine war and the subsequent economic downturn on child poverty in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And I think it's very important to highlight that as a result of the conflict and of course the rising cost of living, there are an additional 10 million people pushed into poverty in the region, which includes 4 million children. Children continues to be disproportionately affected by this type of cri crises. And this is not only visible in terms of economic impact and income in, uh, impact, but also on multidimensional dimensions such as um, child mortality, um, dropping out of school, uh, access to healthy diets, of course. Um, next slide. And on the same day, we also published a global report which was specifically focusing on the current state of the nutrition crisis, particularly affecting early childhood well-being. Um, we focus on, on child food poverty, which we define as children inability to access and consume a minimum diverse diet in early childhood. Um, as we know, the consumption of diverse foods, uh, food groups in early childhood is associated with an improved growth and development. However, unfortunately, across the globe, millions of families continue to struggle to provide their children with the nutritious food they need to grow, develop and learn. And this, of course, has been exacerbated by the current crises. Some of the key highlights from the report what I, that I invite you to, to read, uh, one in three children under five or 200 million children live in severe food poverty. Despite some of the progress that we saw last uh, previous years, previously in the pandemic in terms of, of food poverty, the prevalence um, has not improved very much for, for a decade or so. Um, more than 40% of the children that are living in severe food poverty are eating only one or none of the eight recommended food groups. Um, and of course, this, this number is, is higher, particularly in the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, where right now we have a very specific and, and complicated crisis for the accelerated by, by drought. Um, and to respond to the, you know, this very complex environment, we just launched uh, what we call No Time to Waste, an acceleration plan for early prevention detection and treatment of child wasting in 15 countries, which are the 15 countries most vulnerable to food, uh, to the food global, uh, to the global food and nutrition crisis. It's an acceleration plan that really reflects units of commitment to scale up comprehensive approaches around nutrition and social protection in this particular 15 countries. So we're really focusing on a fragile and, and humanitarian context. Next slide, please. Um, 
I think that it's it's important to to be very clear that you know the, the added value of having a, a group like this one, this working group, is that it brings together and leverages the different expertise and mandates of our organizations to address the crisis together, to really put on the table the different elements that we need to 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 be very um, focus on from our side you know early ages the focus on nutrition on on early childhood development and the, and the importance of really making sure that the urgency around child poverty and child food poverty is very much at the center um, we've been leveraging as unicef our multi-sectoral expertise in both social protection and nutrition our field precedent footprint to really help um, to make that integration a very explicit integration between nutrition and social protection systems become a reality at country level and I would like to share, if you allow me, just five principles and commitment that underpins this joint approach that we have around this important integration. First, the commitment to a systems approach. And this is guided by both our global social protection framework and our nutrition strategy. Um, it's Sometimes we, we spend a lot of time in defining packages, while what really our long-term solution should be to make sure that we have to purposely explore the, the synergies and entry points between social protection and, and nutrition systems. What are those that are more, more likely to reinforce, um, mutually reinforce the impact on children and women? What are the critical connections that we can make between nutrition and social protection at different levels, from evidence, from policy, from financing, from coordination platforms, um, and also to enhance the, the local level capacity to make these linkages work? Um, we continue to invest, of course, in evidence and the understanding of the different relationship and what makes more sense in terms of the best combination of packages and, and approaches. Um, but also, what are the, the, the best mechanisms to create incentives for coordination? It's, you know, we always talk about we need to bring systems together, but usually the bottlenecks come and what are the, why are a sector and the other will, will be inclined to come together. And in that way, we also bring in our expertise around financing to making sure that both sectors are really uh, prioritizing um, an integrated approach when we're defining budget lines across sectors. Um, also uh, making sure that we are strengthening shared information systems, program monitoring, local capacities, and of course, um, overall, continue to connect nutrition and social protection with, with other systems. Um, next slide, please. We, we know very much that there are no blueprints that identify you know, the most relevant entry points between both, both systems. And these, these entry points will be guided by the context, by the political economy, by the, by the, the opportunities that, that we see in the different countries. Um, but maybe some, some key considerations that, that we saw here. Um, as, we, as, we, as we started, if you want, uh, implementing these types of programs um, at, at country level. Um, one is definitely the, the use of, of, of evidence and, and really using that evidence to making sure that we have the best design, um, um, the best design for those for those interventions. Water, how do we better integrate cash with, for example, social behavior change with other types of very specific nutrition specific interventions? Um, to what extent it makes sense to, to expand that to different age groups? Um, also focusing on the, the different points that will make the different difference across the lifetime of, of children. We, of course, um, put a lot of emphasis and prioritization around the first 1,000 days, uh, the critical window of opportunity for child survival, growth, and development. Um, and this is also the period where we also think social protection can have the greatest impact to break and help grape um, the inter intergenerational cycle of poverty and malnutrition. Um, also combining social protection with other uh, types of, of nutrition uh, and social behavior change that improves uh, feeding and dietary practices, which we know are essential to access nutrition services. Um, I think, I don't know if this is the next slide, but um, sorry, I think we need to move to the next slide. I'm so sorry. Um, um, but also I think it's, it's important to make sure that we are, um, at addressing this context, not only in, um, in developing context, but more and more understanding that we need to have a, an explicit commitment to risking for programming and, and adapting our social protection systems also to crises. So um, it needs to be very much triggered um, early enough to be able to prevent and mitigate the consequences of crises. Um, and some of the elements that we've been seeing that could be helpful uh, uh, as we think about this, this, uh, this linkages in, in fragile context, expanding the use of early warning systems to trigger the scaling up and adaptation of short responsive um, social protection and nutrition programs, 
develop, uh, delivering and scaling up um, programs. So we need to be um, committed to have programs at scale, then then we can um, add or, or complement with other interventions. And, and also making sure that we have a very strong um, element of gender equality when we're defining these programs. And, and I think UNICEF has put a lot of emphasis in making sure that it, even though we, we, we aspire to close coverage gaps is equally important to make sure that we have inclusive systems, shock responsive systems, and systems that therefore can become the basis for uh, very, very strong support across different, different sectors. Um, next slide, please. Um, I thought it, we, it was important to, to just end with, with some examples of what all this you know, integrated approach and principles have meant in, in some of the countries that, that we work. And, and of course, I won't go, go into, into detail in, into every, every single country, um, but it's just an, an understanding that there is very context specific entry points. There are a lot of efforts at country level, like the ones you have on the slide here, for instance, in Ethiopia and Yemen, understanding what were the entry points, understanding what was the, the political prioritization and then trying to understand what was the best way to bring together the dimensions of nutrition, of food security, of income support, as well as other interventions, including livelihoods and others to, to really provide with families with the best aligned types of services. We can start with a pilot of interventions as a proof of concept, but in the long term, what you want is to, to create the incentives for this different sectors and ministries and systems to come together and provide that um, collective set, let's say, of services to make impacts um, happen at, at scale. I think the next slides just go goes into more, more um, of those. Um, I thank you very much for, for the attention and looking forward to, to questions during the discussion period. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalia. So insightful as always. Um, and I would like to give now the floor, last but not least, to, to our colleague from FAO, Marco Knowles, who will speak um, to how we can build forward better in the aftermath of the global food and nutrition crisis, um, voicing some of the, of the points made already in this PFB um, kind of discussion around this. So uh, Marco, over to you. Thank you so much. You're muted. Thank you, Hango. Great. Yes. Thank you. Sorry oh. about that. Thank you, Hango, and thank you everyone for these interesting presentations. Uh, my presentation is going to be more it's three slides. I'm going to be summing up what are my perspectives a little bit on uh, the progress that is being made in responding to the high food price crisis, um, and also based on that, uh, what is the way ahead. So, okay, here comparing a little bit on the, the lessons learned in responding to COVID-19 and what I'm seeing in terms of the, the responses to the high food prices. So in responding to COVID-19, globally, it took an average of 83 days from the day in which the first lockdown was, um, uh, was announced to when people received a, a payment, a transfer, 83 days. So imagine that's a long time, you know, it's more than, it's more than two months. If you're a poor person, depending on the income that you earn, every day to feed yourself every day and you have no savings that's a huge amount of time now with the high food prices um in the media it's being associated with the war in ukraine yes there has been a further spike in the prices of food since the war in ukraine began but if you look at uh, if you look at the data already in august 2021 we had reached a 10-year high in food prices so even the response to social protection response to high food prices, I think it's picking up as Ugo presented in his presentation, but it's been very slow because it's, it's over a year since prices have been high. Then the duration of the responses. In responding to COVID-19, we found that 75% of the responses lasted uh, less than three months, which is very short compared to the amount of time that the, the shock of COVID uh, lasted. And yet again, we're seeing in the response to high food prices, so far, it looks like the majority of the responses are one-off payments. And good, better than nothing, but the evidence shows that uh, in terms of uh, supporting consumption, smaller, more regular payments are more effective than one-off larger, lumpier payments, which are generally used for, uh, for, incentivizing, uh, for incentivizing investments. 
such as buying assets. So here again, we're seeing payments uh, or the responses are short in duration, whereas we need longer term responses, seeing it's, it's over a year, the high food prices. Then the value of the transfers. In responding to COVID-19, the transfers were deemed low. Uh, and, and likewise, now, in terms of the, responding to the high food prices, the transfers are low. Just think of Lugo's presentation. He, um, what caught my eye is that in low middle income countries, the value of the transfers is in, on average $0.7. Compare that to the cost of a healthy diet that William presented at the beginning, and there's a huge discrepancy, you know, 0 0.7. Uh, dollars compared to the cost of a, of a healthy diet, which is $3.15, at least it was in 2020, before prices rose. And then looking at uh, the response in terms of inclusivity, and here I'm thinking both within, country, uh, within countries and across countries. In responding to COVID-19, only 23% of responses were gender sensitive. Now, I don't know what's happening with the responses in terms of gender sensitivity, uh, the, the current responses to high food prices, but it's fundamental that they be gender gender sensitive, seeing that women uh, are the most vulnerable to these uh, to these high food prices within the household. They're first to they're among the first to cut back their their food consumption to to protect the food consumption of other household members. Uh, then what we saw in responding to COVID nineteen was that those countries which had more developed systems. Had more, had better responses, more wide-reaching responsive responses, more adequate responses, more inclusive responses. Whereas countries with lower developed uh, social protection systems had uh, less effective responses. And I'm wondering what you know what has hap what is happening now in terms of uh, the, the quality of the responses to the high food prices. And uh, something else is also in terms of the spending. In, uh, with respect to in, during COVID-19, high-income countries were being encouraged by international financial institutions to increase their spending in responding to COVID-19, including their spending on social protection. That was not the case for with the developing countries. They weren't receiving the same type of encouragement. And what we see now, again, from the data that the World Bank is, is collecting, is that, is is that high-income countries and upper-middle-income countries have so far spent 10.5 times more in, uh, in their social protection responses compared to uh, lower middle income and low income countries. So here we see, you know, possibly this is going to generate even greater inequality within countries and between countries. And now um, looking at what, what needs to be done, it's fundamental to expand adequate coverage, right? Here I'm emphasizing the adequacy of coverage because in order, to, in order to have impacts on improving food security and nutrition, it's important that the value of the transfers is, sufficiently, is of a sufficient size. Then we need to place social protection at the heart of, of the responses. And I think there's encouraging progress here in that uh, the UN Global Crisis Group on Food, Energy and Finance has placed social protection as, at the heart of the response it's, it's recommending. Uh, likewise, the Global Alliance for Food Security, convened by the G7, includes social protection as one of the main thrusts of the response. And as a social protection community, we need to continue to advocate for social protection to be at the heart of the responses. And clearly, there's a need to, to expand the fiscal space. Uh, now, here, you may be wondering why, why a rocket. Uh, two reasons. One is, I think it denotes it with the acceleration that is needed in terms of the financing that needs to be provided, needs to be made available for responding to the increasing food crisis. But also because it reminds me of a podcast I was listening to a year or so ago about uh, how the US managed to land the first man on the moon, uh, Louis Armstrong. No? And it was really about political commitment. And so yet again, it's fundamental to mobilize a political commitment. Uh, one probably thought it was impossible to get someone onto the moon, but with political commitment, it became possible. And likewise here, political commitment can make the expansion of social protection to all possible. It's fundamental. Uh, and it's possible, as we saw with the case of COVID-19, uh, there were 4,000 responses across 222 economies. So social... <laughs> That goes to show that political commitment can be used for. Sorry, 
political commitment can be effective in, uh, in mobilizing uh, financing. And then it's fundamental to coordinate with the humanitarian responses between the social protection sector and humanitarian assistance. Uh, this requires defining the roles of the humanitarian actors and social protection actors, who does what, um, including coordinating who, you know, uh, which, which population groups are going to be reached by which set of actors, which geographic areas, aligning uh, transfer values, targeting criteria, and building on each other's, each other's systems. And then it's important to leave no one behind. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, it's important to be aware of which are the population groups that are going to be most affected by these high food prices. Uh, clearly, it's the poor, the most vulnerable, women, children, as Natalia was mentioning. And let's not forget about the rural poor. 80% of the extreme poor live in rural areas. Uh, and they're receiving a double punch. On the one hand, there's an increase in the price of inputs, fertilizers, pesticides, which they need for the agricultural production. And on the other hand, there's also an increase in the price of food. And uh, some believe that people in rural areas produce all the food they consume, but that's actually not true. They purchase on the market most of the food that they consume. So also people in rural areas uh, are going to be poor people in rural areas are going to be highly affected by these increasing food prices. And now looking forward, uh, again, I think the, in terms of the longer term, it's about, once again, expanding adequate coverage. The slides are almost identical. This is not because it's, it's not a lapse. It's because I think what is needed for the short term and for the, uh, is also is similar to what is needed for the long term and vice versa. We need to place social protection at the heart of development policies in that, and I think it's important to emphasize development here. The COVID-19 and now the increasing food prices uh, are drawing attention to the important role that social protection can play in managing crises, and that is true. But there's also a risk that social protection becomes increasingly associated as an instrument exclusively for managing emergencies. And that's not the case. The evidence shows that social protection plays a role in improving nutrition, in improving education, in improving health outcomes, climate adaptation, climate mitigation. And so it needs to be placed at the heart of these policies, at the heart of food systems thinking, um, so, so, as to, so as to attract the longer term financing for, for developing these systems so that they're better able to respond uh, also when there is a, an emergency. Financing needs to be expanded. Uh, this is a very interesting, uh, it's a very striking map that the ILO has produced. They're comparing countries with the lowest coverage and countries with the, with the greatest financing caps, uh, gaps. And there's a one-to-one -one match. You know? Where there are the financing gaps is where coverage is the lowest. So it's, it's fundamental to expand the fiscal space for, de for developing these, uh, these systems. And this is where the global accelerator for jobs and social protection and the just tr transition is, is extremely relevant. You know, this, this makes a case for uh, providing technical and financial support to countries in, in um, immobilizing financing. So yes, countries, states are those are primarily responsible for, for mobilizing the financing, but there is also international solidarity needs to come to, we need to come together as a global community in supporting countries in creating this fiscal space. And uh, now also responding to one of the comments or questions in, in, the, uh, in the chat, this coordination between humanitarian responses and development responses can play a role also in expanding coverage in the longer term. There are these short-term responses which are being implemented now. How do we use these to expand coverage over the longer term? And uh, so as I was saying earlier, we must leave no one behind. Social protection systems need to be adapted to the diversity of the population groups that they are intended to serve. This includes women, indigenous people, people living with, with, uh, uh, with disabilities. And importantly, let's not forget the rural areas. I think COVID-19, now the increasing food prices are drawing attention to the importance of expanding coverage in urban areas. That's true, but that must not come at the cost of expanding coverage in rural areas, which is where 80% of the extreme poor are living. And finally, and this is a difference with the, uh, with the previous slide, 
is importance of monitoring food prices. So social uh, shock responsive social protection is often is informed by uh, climate risks. What, uh, but it's also important that we use food price information to uh, to trigger to trigger reactions responses by the social protection system. It mustn't happen again that more than a year passes before there is before there is a heightened response before the, there is a substantive response to an increase in food prices. This is both at the the national level, but also at the global level. And this is where a group like the uh, this group, the USP 2030 on food systems, can play a role in monitoring what is happening to food prices and informing the global community when there's a need for, for a response. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Marco, wow. And to all our speakers, Natalia and Sol, that are really uh, helping us to understand the how. We've understood the what, what is the problem, why does it matter? Uh, but we've now delved deeper into, into the how question. So thank you so much to all our speakers for their very illuminating contribution. We want to encourage the audience, encourage the audience to submit their comments, questions, and reflections in the chat box, not a, in the Q&A really box. There's the chat. So make sure that we put them there. Um, I want to open the floor for the next minutes. Uh, to go over some questions that we have. And one of them, uh, I'll start with the Sahelian context where, uh, uh, and where we have got a, a very interesting question from our participants. And he's saying um, in French, in the Sahelian context where malnutrition has become structural and the resources diminished to address it, what durable solutions can be put in place to help governments respond to the crisis um, uh, within the, the, the social protection scope, right? And we've had an incredible, incredible um, comment and already exchange in the chat um, with, with our colleague Jen Jablonski from UNICEF, who has brought the issue of sustained investments of uh, ensuring that we have a long-term vision. So uh, she really, she really, she has really asked the question here in synthesis, how do we use opportunities created through investments in new, but often short-term measures, as it was well exemplified and explained by, by Ugo, to expand social assistance coverage? And I would come there with a third question is, are we, are we understanding and how are we helping governments or guide decision-making um, of governments that are often put in the crossroads between investments in the expansion of coverage versus those of adequacy, as we saw the cost of a nutritious and healthy diet, as explained by William and, and, and also uh, Saul, uh, are higher are higher than expected. So we have a very restricted fiscal space as we see from responses already occurring to, to, to COVID. Um, how do we guide governments towards, towards that? So three questions for all our panel and very happy um, to see all of other questions coming to our Q&A box down there in, the, in, 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 your, in your screen. Thank you. So, who would like to go first? Maybe you can unmute Marco and don't worry, you can put your camera now. So we, we have a, a very nice discussion. Thank you so much. So I don't know, how do we address, Ugo, I think you were having already a really good conversation around uh, Jen Jablonski's, um, Jennifer Jablonski's question and comment, which was really good. So maybe we can start with the issue of what should we do to capitalize from these responses? And what about coverage and adequacy? Right, and uh, th there seems to be kind of a common thread uh, among all of these questions. I also liked very much uh, the, the question posed by Elizabeth. Um, and uh, uh, there was this uh, great paper uh, uh, published last year by Popol and others on how to respond to flood, floods in Bangladesh. They um, uh, examined what, what are the effects on assets, something that Marco mentioned in his presentation, and the range of, of, of other welfare dimensions. The moment that you anticipate the shock, you provide 
transfers in advance uh, when when uh, uh, shocks are predictable in large scale versus uh, the more traditional um, expulse response. And and the results are are very clear in terms of uh, um, the level of assets that are preserved, um, the the cost, the response, um, the the range of uh, positive outcomes that there are by simply shifting up a little bit the response in the time frame. Um, we have seen so much in terms of the COVID response, but also inflation how much a number of decisions uh, were somewhat idiosyncratic on you know, how far should you go in terms of coverage, who to cover for how long with how much. And uh, if you look at the balance between uh, discretionary spending and automatic stabilizers, the balance definitely is towards the former. So, so many responses were discretionary. And um, um, I think there is an interesting agenda towards making, uh, enhancing a little bit the um, uh, anticipatory um, uh, effects of those responses by establishing a system of early warning systems that has specific triggers that can inform scale up decisions. Uh, there is a lot that one could learn from the climate space in this regard. And there is a lot of lateral learning that could get into health responses but uh, as well. Um, but I think that uh, we know that this, this sort of approach uh, may pay off, but the question is still, why don't we prepare enough? Um, and um, um, there is one country that comes to mind, Sierra Leone. Uh, Sierra Leone learned from the Ebola response from floods in 2017, and they established a risk financing framework that uh, helped kickstart the COVID response, even at small scale with $4 million, but dollars. But uh, that uh, that was a clear case that uh, sometimes connecting early warnings, triggers, and scale-up decisions uh, can, can be done in advance if you have uh, uh, good data and you invest in preparedness, uh, you have pre-positioned financing for it. There will still be space for discretionary sp spending for the policy space but I think an important agenda moving forward is how we rebalance a little bit the composition between automatic and discretionary spending. And there is a lot more that can be done, I think, whether it's it's a hell or elsewhere in, uh, in um, uh, harnessing a number of early warning systems that exist, by the way, some of which are also used by humanitarian agencies. Hence, also, there might be payouts there in terms of coordination in ensuring that the early warning systems inform both humanitarian responses and, and government system responses as well. So that's, I think, it, it's an important source of coordination as well. I'll, I'll stop here. Great. I mean, you, I think you're touching all these points uh, that Natalia very clearly spelled out for us, the element of anticipatory action, maintaining and sustaining this this and working across really the nexus between this. So Natalia, I would love to hear from you what your thoughts are uh, from this question around coverage, around the sustainability of this. And, and this key question, I think, Ugo, you've given us another very good question here. Amazing one is why don't we prepare better if we know this and evidence is coming out there. And I would just like to give a parenthesis. UNICEF and Tomo Kubo is sharing with us some of the great resources that Natalia uh, showed us in the presentation. So please, Ugo, feel free to share the incredible work you're doing and analysis in the chat for our participants, as well as this paper from Sierra Leone and Bangladesh as well that you were mentioning. So thank you all for sharing that with our participants. So Natalia. Thanks, Ugo. I don't, I don't know if my comments are going to be a little controversial, but I think that we, we a technical and conceptual level, it's very clear what needs to be done. This is just, for me, a, a political economy, political prioritization question, right? So um, we always have known that, yes, to prepare for a next crisis, let's invest in strengthening systems and making them more risk-informed and shock responsive. That's something that we've said for, for, for a long time. That is not something that is necessarily prioritized because you don't see immediate payoffs in one political term because it's not something that it's seen as, you know, sexy enough or, or that will you know get all the votes that you need, et cetera. So what 
what are, what are those triggers that will make that that change? The same is for we, we keep saying there's no physical space. The, the 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 resources are just being used for other types of purposes, particularly in the Sahel. If you see the the amount of resources that is focused on security and military, for example, that's you know I'm not saying anything that nobody knows, but it's it's very clear that, that there is a big disproportion on how much resources are being prioritized to focus on long-term crisis such as nutrition and, and food systems. So, and and I think COVID was was very interesting because COVID was not just something that that impacted the poorest of the poor; it impacted almost everybody, which I think created those political incentives for governments to say, well, we need to find financial resources and fiscal space somewhere because we need to support our voters and we need to support you know, the next generation. So it's, it's a bit of a cynical remark here, but it's, it's, I think we need to also be very consistent how we find the balance between the, the technical elements and the, and the very context specific political economy and, and how can we leverage our data, our, but also our expertise and our ability to bring together those very key investment case arguments so that it resonates with the people that are making decisions, particularly at the financial level. And, and I think that is the role that we should play as, as UN, as agencies, as, as you know, collaborators and researchers in, in yes, put in the data, yes, put in the conceptual elements and the technical um, um, recommendations, but also be very close to governments at country level in, in, in accompanying and, and, and slowly changing the, the, the political discourse and the political prioritization around those those elements. And, and, and for me, that, that is, you know, there, there are examples where that has happened. There are examples where there's been a transformation that took a long time, but there were, hasn't been that prioritization and focus because that was, that was uh, so I, I, I don't know if that's the kind of, of reaction you, you wanted, but, that, but for me, this is, this is key. And, and that again comes the other point about the role of humanitarian funding, there is a very critical role, and we haven't done that yet, in alignment, climate financing, humanitarian financing, and development financing for co a common set of, of, of elements, such as the food and, and nutrition crisis. They were still working in parallel. We're still not aligning that. Um, and it's very difficult to create, again, the incentives for humanitarian funding to say, okay, fine, I'm going to put some of my resources in preparedness. I'm going to put some of my resources on risk-informed programming. That's still it's clear it's on the paper, has been for many years in the grand bargain, but it's not, has not translated into concrete elements at, at country country level. So make stop there. <laughs> Thanks for that. Political economy incentives. And it's not just about the ability, but kind of like the acceptance and authority um, allowing these things to happen because of political payoffs that may uh, intervene there. Those are great points, Natalia. I would like to give the, the word to Marco, um, who can maybe expand a little bit more around this issue related to fiscal space um, and, and how do we see that. And I would suggest that we, and I love, Natalia, that you brought it up, uh, the work of Isabel Ortiz and Cummins, where they talk about the different alternatives that countries have to respond to crisis and to use social protection and expand, you know, the use of it. So just important that we know it, but uh, there, there are some political issues limiting our capacity to action it. So Marco, over to you. Thanks, Juango. It, yeah, really complimenting what, what Natalia said, no? Um, I fully agree with no, what Natalia said regarding it's a political decision. You see, imagine, look at how much funding has been mobilized to finance the, the war in Ukraine at the moment no, by, the, by the West. It's just clear that it, when there are political interests, political motivations, which, are, which does not mean it, it's bad, uh, but things, financing does get mobilized. So essentially, it's a political decision. Um, here, I think there is the role that Nadia and uh, Natalia just explain what what a development community can do in terms of at the global level with uh, with partner governments, but also I think we have an important role to play in in um, in supporting collective action you know, of the of those of the clients of social protection program programs in mobilizing themselves and demanding that there be increased financing exp that social protection programs be be expanded. Um, so. You know, one argument is a rights-based argument. There's a right. It's a human social protection is a human right, and there are also then there's also other arguments in terms of uh, supporting adaptation to climate change. The investment argument that Natalia mentioned, but I, I think it's also important to, not to lose sight of the clients of social protection programs. They can also play a role with us, support. we can support them in playing this role in making social protection a political issue. 
so that it's discussed in some countries it is part of the political agenda uh, even even more so recently you know with respect to to covid 19 so how do we place social protection as part of the political agenda great that thanks so much uh i wanna i wanna just ask uh, and bring a little bit about this nutrition focus so we've seen some some questions coming around that uh, I would like to to hear from William and Saul as to how do we see you know the limitations, the challenges for governments maybe and for key stakeholders uh, to really embrace this nutrition agenda and the long term investments and long term efforts that need to be made uh, to 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 address the unaffordability of nutritious and healthy diets. Um, so like maybe. Saul and William, please feel free to come in. We have 10 more minutes to go. Thank you, Juan, Juan, Juan Gonzalo. Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, really important. And of course, you know, it, to some extent, it can make the whole challenge seem even more overwhelming when you realize that the cost of a nu nutrient adequate or even worse, a fully healthy diet is so much more than the cost of uh, uh, just a calorie energy sufficient diet. And so I think to some degree, uh, perhaps the nutrition community, we shoot ourselves a little bit in the foot by uh, insisting on, on this so much because it's, it's almost an excuse for inaction because it seems such an overwhelming challenge. Nonetheless, there are clearly things that can be done uh, thinking about the nutrition impact of these programs and trying to maximize them even in a limited fiscal space. There are many countries where we see really a plethora of different social protection programs. I'm thinking of some South Asian countries where there are hundreds of different social protection programs. Probably in the interests of efficiency and maximizing the available funding that there is for social protection and getting the most nutrition benefit out of that, there's a considerable amount of rationalization that could be done to go down from hundreds of different of social protection programs to a couple of dozen even or a handful of the most effective ones that really achieve the impacts that we're thinking of. Likewise, in many, many countries, there are subsidies that for those of us who, who are concerned about uh, potential nutrition impacts really seem troublesome or irrational. So there are many countries where sugar is subsidized. I can't think of a worse thing to subsidize for uh, the, if your concern is for better nutrition impacts. Sugar, sugar should be taxed. You can use sugar tax as a source of income to subsidize uh, some of these programs or, sub, or, or subsidies on nutritional foods. So really looking at some of these, that's a very clear cut case. There are less clear cut cases such as the subsidy in Egypt on, on uh, bread which uh, the arguments could be uh, taken to a slightly further de degree. It's not quite so obvious. The third point I think is important to make is that not all uh, social protection needs to be government led. There are, is potential for the private sector to contribute to uh, elements of social protection. Uh, and I think uh, the interest that we've had in the Workforce Nutrition Alliance is really encouraging in this uh, respect. Many companies uh, either already do or take little persuasion to be convinced that it is in their commercial even interest to look after the nutritional status of their employees and their supply chain workers and are prepared to make investments in uh, trying to ensure that. And that's really, uh, given the number of people that there are in employment or in, uh, uh, or in uh, supply chains, that's really potentially a a major contribution to this, which would not have to come out of government coffers. So I think that's very important. And finally, just to mention that, you know, as governments think about their pathways to food systems transformation uh, coming out of the last year's food systems summit, it's really heartening to see that uh, social protection has been included in so many of these. And I think uh, this shows us that uh, governments are prepared to uh, perhaps begin to uh, put some of their uh, cash where the, the rhetoric is and to recognize that this must be an investment in improving food systems qualities. Yeah, thank you for that. Very hopeful indeed uh, to see, you know, the recognition of social protection as, a, as an option in these pathways. William, uh, would you like to come in and give us some thoughts? 
Yeah, this. maybe just add add two things that haven't been mentioned yet. Um, first of all, very rich discussion, um, and especially appreciating the comments uh, in the chat and the Q and A um, from participants. And the two things that really strike out, jump out to me, are uh, first of all the question of whether this new diet cost framing using nutrition prices can change that political economy, can make it possible to speak of how social protection alters people's ability to meet their human universal needs. And then to lay out, and the second point is to lay out this nutritional ladder. So as Saul said, you wouldn't want the best to be the enemy of the good. Because if you say we can never reach this goal, then we shouldn't even start, then you're self-defeating yourself. But if you say, no, we map out a ladder of increasing nutrient adequacy to meet these biological needs inside people that you can't see, taste, or smell, but we know they're there, that if people have this protection, these safety nets and these assistance programs, they will have zinc, vitamin A, uh, and so forth for their immune function. And then beyond that, there are further steps. So that in every country of the world, it's not just poor countries or rich countries, it's not just uh, specific demographic groups, it's everyone, this ladder of, of increasing needs. And the closing point I wanna make about this is just how recent these, these learnings are about what's going on in nutrition. Um, it's only in the last decade that we've had real data on dietary intake and health outcomes in order to map what the ladder looks like. Um, so it's not surprising, this is something that is genuinely new. Um, so it's not surprising that governments don't already know this. Like, we were only learning it. Um, and so it's a very exciting moment, I think, for um, nutrition and human development generally to learn what that ladder of nutritional improvement for longevity, for uh, people to reach their human potential really can, can look like. Okay, thank you very much. I know if there are any final points, we have three minutes. Uh, I would just like to, to thank everyone very much uh, for joining us, the panelists and you, uh, you know, the incredible number of participants we've had here. I'm afraid that this is what all the time we've had for the sessions. However, this is only, only the first iteration of what we're sure will become a long lasting policy dialogue series within this uh, universal social protection by 2030 uh, initiative. We're already planning for the next iteration, which will take place in January next year. And as always, we're eager uh, to hear everyone's suggestions and ideas for topics and speakers uh, that ensure that we have diversity of views and from different institutions, even if you're not part of our working group and you're very welcome to join us. Everyone remember to stay engaged, to continue sharing resources and to keep an eye on socialprotection.org for the release of the podcast episode to learn more about uh, our blogs and a series of reflections that we're doing around this and many other topics related to social protection and food systems. I would, uh, for all of those that participated in the event, we will answer to those many questions we received. We didn't have the time to respond. And thank you very much for your engagement, for your interest, for your ideas in this space. We, we're very happy we have the opportunity uh, to move this conversation forward. So I don't know if anybody has any final points to make in the last two minutes. Quickly. Hugo? Uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's too little time <laughs> maybe for... Uh... Well, another time we, we can discuss it but uh, thank you thank you for having us uh juan gonzalo a great uh, great pleasure to join you all for this conversation thank you yes we will be uh also awaiting uh more evidence coming up in ja in november around the the social protection responses to inflation and uh thank you all very much for your time and goodbye <laughs>